Any apologies? I know we've had Rick's going to leave early, but not early, early. Um, we have, yeah, so Scott, Scott Haldane's on leave this week. Yeah. So send his apologies and Kathy Walsh, interim right. medical director. Same as yesterday, we've had nobody. Same added. as yesterday. Yeah. We've had nothing from any governors as such. No. But, okay, well, we might as well get going. Um, I think Pri is with us now, so that's good. Just open that. So we, we have your questions, thank you, and I'll try and make sure they get fed in at appropriate junctures. Um, but if I forget, if you could just indicate in the chat, that would be helpful. And if everybody could go on mute unless they're speaking, oh, that would be helpful as well. Um, so we don't get background noise, and I think everybody's doing that. Um, what I want to do next is just to go through the minutes of the last meeting. I don't think we've had anything about the minutes. We've had some things about the action log, which we'll go through. Um, anybody got any issues with the minutes? No? We'll accept those. Thank you very much. And then in terms of the action log, and it's quite right, it shouldn't have been... Um, we noted it, it shouldn't have been closed off until the meeting. It's all right to give you the old actions. In fact, some of those old actions probably don't need to be there for very much longer because they've been there a long time. So they've been there sort of middle of 2022. But in terms of um, the action that was closed on the 30th of the 3rd before this meeting, I think the issue was also around, um, it only answered half of the question. So I don't know if Karen or Stephen wants to come back in terms of answering the whole question. And it was an, um, a meeting for lead governors and the integrated care board scheduled. Oh no, that wasn't, that wasn't that one, sorry. It was uh, just checking the number. Uh, it was 12.22. Yeah, it was 12.22. It was the PS and Q committee, Karen. Right, so somebody's gonna have to remind me what DOP and BD stands for. Because I've forgotten. It's, it's Stephen. Oh, right. <laughs> um, We've gone on to acronyms for this. So we have DOFs for the Director of Finance. We have DOOs for the Director of Operations. And now we've got something okay. that's quite intelligible. Actually, it's DOPES. Sorry. <laughs> Director of People. Yeah. Right. Right. So, yes, ongoing discussions it is a standing agenda item at Pierce and Q now, the cultural report. Um, as a standing agenda item, keeping um, holding the execs to account. One of the things we're now discussing, not so much then in, in December, but now, is what would outcomes look like? We've got a pro we've got a programme plan, lots of activity on it, and the discussion now is, okay, so what are the priorities, top 10, and what would good look like? What would the outcomes look like? Okay. Um, I think inter the other bit was of this one was actually around the exit interviews. I've just found it now in terms of it's the one below that for PS and Q. I didn't realize you had to improve staff exit interview completion rates to better understand why staff are leaving. Explore, ask <laughs> managers to ask staff working their notice period why they are leaving in addition to prompts from the HR teams. Right. Yes, we want to know why and find out earlier upstream why people are leaving. It's work on progress. In in respect of the second element, I can't answer that. That's probably Stephen's Stephen. answer. Stephen, do you want to come in? Because it's a 20% response rate, which is... Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Actually, the 20% response rate is reasonably good in the context of the, um, the country. The, the CIPD talk about 15%, so we've got 20%. Um, that I think, as um, Karen's just said, um, at Pierce and Q, the challenge to us is actually we need to get that better. We need to be at like 30 percent, you know, um, which would be double the national response rate, I hasten to add. So we currently brought somebody in and part of our re retention program actually is we've got somebody who physically goes out now and does that. And they go out and see people and try and understand why are they leaving the organization and what we fed through to ps and q last time was that actually we are seeing that 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 response rate go up slowly uh, and there are two things there when somebody goes they fill in a form basically and it's it stops their wages and it's a form that says this is the reason why i'm going and this is where i'm going and then what we're talking about here is actually physically sitting down and doing the exit interview and we're seeing that slowly but surely get better and then we provide that information through to ps and q where the neds actually hold us to account on that okay so you actually now have got the answer to the second half which we got, we'll make sure we log into the minutes so you've got both halves of that action 
so yeah, the issue was it was only one half of the action was um, was reported on. The other issue is around Action 12 13 a which is um, one that is still open, but it's around actually having the wording changed to ensure that it, it says what was actually agreed at the meeting. And um, so ideally governors would like to call COG meetings, would like all COG meetings to be blended, i.e. face-to-face -face with an online option. We understand that technology for a blended meeting is being sourced and implemented, we therefore propose that COG meetings remain online as and until it, a blended option is available. We pilot a blended meeting as soon as that is possible, evaluate and consider the next steps. And we identify opportunities for governors to meet face to face on a regular basis, i.e. governor development sessions. This is to be discussed further at our next informal meeting. So that's what's now going to be properly recorded. And I will just ask Anna if she has any update on when the um, I know it was initially called an owl, but I think they've gone for something a bit different to an owl. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so, so, um, sorry, Julie, I haven't got an update in terms of when, um, but I do know that these were um, items that we've purchased this, we've purchased them or we've put the order in for them because we wanted to do that this financial year. And you're right. We haven't gone for the owl. We've gone for, um, the system that board members will recall we experienced when we went to the Microsoft yeah. head offices in um, London. So it's um, even better than the OWL. And we've we've ordered several of them, um, at, at, at four or five at different sites across the um, county. Well then, Keith, you should be able to see it in action well before you're, you finish being a, a governor, not a lead governor, because that actually ends in the next day or so. So, yeah. Um, OK. I think, is there anybody else got any issues? I'm sorry, I made a mess of that in, in terms of guiding Karen to the correct um, action. Anybody got any other issues in, in terms of that one? Nope, okay. We'll move on to the body of the meeting. First of all, it's trust chair's report, just to say a couple of things. One, in terms of the lead governor, and I've already mentioned Keith, one is to say, this is Keith's last council of governors as lead governor. And, um, you know, of the last, few years, four years, he's been a superb lead governor. He's helped us take governors to a place where they hadn't been before and really represented you well and also helped to shape our interactions with governors in a way that um, we wouldn't have done, been able to do without him. And I'm sure we're all very grateful for his support, guidance and um, always being there, Keith. You know, you only have to give you a, a text or an email and, and you come back really quickly and we can have conversations. So thank you for that. But we all know we're pebbles in the pond. I likewise am a pebble in the pond. And, <laughs> uh, and on the 1st of April, the, the new lead governor will be Andrea, who I know will be equally as good, but also she'll do things in a different way. One, because she works and has other ideas around um, how things might be able to operate. So thank you, Keith, and welcome, Andrea. I'm sure that uh, you know the baton will be passed and we'll go from strength to strength. Keith. Um, th th thanks, Julie. I've actually completed five years. I had a funny feeling. Four I year right term. <laughs> five years of a four year term as lead governor. That's what happens when the chair is a former chief constable. You see, <laughs> you end up doing more more time than than, than you'd anticipated. <laughs> um, uh, it has been a very fulfilling experience. Generally enjoyable. Occasionally very frustrating. Um, I reflected on my time at our AGM. Um, so I won't repeat that, just to say a big thank you to everyone and that my involvement with the Trust continues as a volunteer and for the next 15 months as a backbench governor. Thank you. <laughs> and we all know backbench governors or backbenchers can be far worse than front benches. So hey ho, <laughs> watch this space. So yeah, thanks, Keith. And I'll say welcome, Andrea. Um, the next is just, uh, in essence, giving you part of... Um, the nominations committee which was held this week because the assurance process to nominations committee who i'm sure will be able to assure and reassure you that the process um for the appraisals of the neds has happened i've interviewed and spoken to them all and i've we've written up the, the their appraisals which are now being lodged with caroline and i shared my power final paragraphs with the with nominations committee so leading by example we have done all our um appraisals and I don't know if Keith wants to just come in now and just 
mention the chair's appraisal, which we almost completed just before this meeting. <laughs> Um, well, yes. Uh, I mean, just going back to the net appra uh, appraisals, it, it's to say that um, uh, the, the governor's uh, responsibility um, is, uh, well, the governor's on nominations committee. It's our responsibility um, to provide assurance to the Council of Governors that a robust and comprehensive process has been undertaken. Um, and we can provide that assurance. We saw... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, a summary, uh, a written summaries of all of the NED appraisals. We had opportunities to ask um, uh, uh, Julie and Caroline, the chair and the trust secretary, detailed questions about the process followed. So very happy to provide that assurance to the Council of Governors. Um, with regards to um, chair's appraisal, um, it, 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 is, it is almost uh, completed. Um, I, I think no, normally we, we would present it um, uh, at this meeting, um, but um, there, there have been some unavoidable delays because of um, uh, leave and what have you. But um, the process is, is well underway. An initial draft has been prepared. Uh, we've met with Julie to discuss um, objectives for the incoming chair, as well as um, um, Julie's performance against her objectives for the last year. Um, so uh, again, I can provide assurance that everything is being done as it should be there as well. Um, and of course, this is Julie's last Council of Governors meeting. Still feels a little too early to begin the thank yous and reflections, but I think it is important that it is noted how much governors have appreciated Julie's chairing of these meetings over the last nine years and Julie, your support for governors. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's, I can't actually think I'm leaving, to be honest, and um, <laughs> I shall just slowly, slowly float away on the 31st of May and that'll be, that'll be it. I'll probably ring Caroline every now and again or Anna because they'll be on speed dial. <laughs> and uh, have conversations and forget that I'm no longer there. But that's the way the cookie crumbles. I said, we're all pebbles in ponds. And um, I know that the next chair will take um, CPFT working with the board and governors, the chief exec to the next level. So I'm absolutely clear about that. It's, it's, uh, we're an organization of amazing staff who do amazing things on a daily basis and need our support. Um, just moving on from from that uh, for nominations committee uh, you have a little bit there in terms of remco as to what was decided at last remunerations committee i know there's a later question on um, from governors around what's happening and how are we paying for the upcoming pay rises we'll cover that there because that wasn't clearly covered at remunerations committee this was more for um very senior managers who are not um out on strike and also making sure that um their pay is in the proper bands for their um, for their their particular roles. In terms of nomination committee, you've already heard Ned appraisal, chairs appraisal. We also look at in that in that committee at Ned's terms and looking at when the next process needs to happen to recruit Neds. And we will definitely need to start recruiting Neds probably mid June, uh, potentially for Jeff who will be finishing his second term. Uh, and has already given notice that he doesn't want to continue thereafter, not for any other reason than he thinks six years is enough and he should get in his boat and, and, and sail away into the sun. Um, so that will need to start in about June time for, for, uh, for Jeff, but May will also look to find the replacement for Mike, who will finish in, in May next year. So that process, uh, Caroline, is, is already in discussion with, with governors to make sure we have that proper succession process going through. And Keith, I don't know if you just want to give an update on chair recruitment. Uh, yes, yeah, very, very happy to, Julie. Um, so uh, again, this is the first Council of Governors meeting since we held the interviews for Julie's successor. They were on Monday, 20th of February. Um, uh, and uh, at the end of what had been a very rigorous process and was definitely governor led, um, with governors um, uh, uh, chairing um, uh, all of the stakeholder panels and the final interview panel, um, uh, we, we took the decision not to appoint any of the shortlisted candidates. 
So um, we were anxious to begin the recruitment process, um, uh, re sort of restart the recruitment process straight away. But we were advised by the, um, uh, the new recruitment agency that we're using to delay the process for two or three months because there are a number of strong candidates um, they're involved with who have interviews elsewhere in the region um, and, and they, they won't consider another application until those rounds have been completed. So uh, uh, given the experience we'd had and the advice we were receiving, we took the decision to invite expressions of interest from um, our, our current um, uh, non-executive directors to be interim chair um, for, for a period of six months and that process is underway. So the, the interview panel um, for, for that process will be drawn from the governors uh, on NOMCOM. Uh, and, and so that's where we are at the moment. Thanks. And the other thing just to say that we discussed was looked at um, a review of appointed governors of which we are short in some areas and we will be approaching uh, different organizations. We, I mean, Cambridge University Hospitals, NWAFT, the voluntary sector, to make sure that we have a proper rep representation of other um, organisations that should be part of uh, governors. And also, as part of that, when we've had really uh, engaging members from those organisations, we learn as much about their views and perspectives that actually help us in our judgments about what we need to do as a as a council of governors so we will be writing letters and Caroline is, is currently drafting those and we'll get those off ASAP to hopefully um, increase our appointed governors uh, with which Claire Daunton I see uh, sent me a note I don't know if she's joined us but she's got a power cut so that's why Claire's not here <laughs> talking about appointed governors um, and so that was, we had a full, in fact, we were over the hour for nominations committee. So it was very full of uh, conversations. If anybody has any questions, they could ask Keith, they can ask me. Um, they can also ask Diana and Helen, who are also part of that committee, and Andrea, who are all on, also on that committee. So we can all answer questions for you. Um, with which I will now go to the chief exec. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, so you can see my report there, and I, I will take it as read, but just a couple of things to sort of highlight and update, really. So the first item there is around the integrated care system and um, the requirement that we uh, um, provided a five-year joint forward plan. So this is the first time that the system has done such a comprehensive um, forward plan. And um, I can confirm that our draft has been submitted um, early earlier today. Um, we at CPFT, um, many of us at CPFT were heavily involved in um, developing and co-producing that plan. Um, and as I say, that's now gone off as a draft. Um, we'll then get some feedback probably on that and we'll be able to do some more iterations of that before we need to um, publish the final, as you can see there at the end of June. Um, there's a couple of updates in terms of things that are happening nationally. So the National Mental Health LD and Autism Inpatient Quality Transformation Programme. Um, so we are very much engaged in this. So Penny is taking an executive um, lead on this um, and we are um, uh, engaging on all, in all the webinars and making sure that we are fully participating in that transformational programme so that we can get the benefits for our inpatient um, areas. Um, there is also um, the, the Department of Health is also conducting a review of inpatient services. So this is kind of a desktop review and it was following the concerns which became apparent through the Panorama programme and the dispatches programme um, through sort of covert um, filming. So this has prompted a national review of um, inpatient oh, noise. <laughs> uh, that's a national review in patient settings and again um, we're expecting that to be published uh, in the spring so once we see that and the recommendations which are relevant for us we'll um, have a process of reviewing those and, and um, taking those forward. 
Um, another really big piece of work that we need to take forward is the uh, race equality um, framework. We were talking about this today as a group of um, uh, executives um, and how we will make sure that we've got the right focus and the right people in the organisation to make sure that we embed um, all of the requirements of that framework. So you can see there, Debbie is leading on it from an executive point of view, but actually it's something that all of the executive team are taking a focus on. Um, we'll make sure that there's reporting on progress of that through the uh, Patient Safety and uh, People Safety and Quality uh, Committee. And then there's just a brief update there around um, industrial action. So just to add to this, so um, obviously there was some um, industrial action in March. There is now, since the writing of this report, confirmed um, industrial action for junior doctors um, on the week following Easter. So from the Tuesday through to the Saturday morning. So it's four days of um, industrial action, which is expected. So we're in the process at the moment of all of the really detailed operational planning to ensure that we can keep our services running that have to keep running and that we can keep those running safely. We had really good engagement from operational and clinical teams um, previously in terms of the planning and on the days of the strikes. There's no reason to think that we won't have as good engagement as people can possibly give this time. I think though we need to recognise that there are likely to be fewer people around um, during that Easter holiday period and the, um, the risks are greater because it is following a four day weekend with the bank holidays as well. Um, so, so lots of planning going into making sure we can um, keep our services running safely. Then the final item there is around the cultural review and of, of course we've got um, uh, uh, an item on that on the agenda so I won't I won't dwell on that. Okay. Any questions for Anna? No. Uh, you may well have when we get to um, cultural reviews and uh, and that area. Um, okay. You've probably given some of your report already, Keith. But do you want to come in now? Um, thanks, Julie. Yes, I, I I think the only thing that I wanted to draw further attention to. Um, that I've included in my report um, is uh, what, what I think are very positive discussions that um, as governors, lead governors, we're having with the ICB. So um, uh, talking to fellow lead governors uh, around the region, um, we, we have a good line of communication open. That is not the case everywhere. Um, uh, and I very much appreciate John O'Brien's um, uh, uh, openness and, and willingness uh, to talk uh, with us uh, and to us. So I've given a summary of our meeting on the 31st of January um, in my update. Um, uh, and um, for we, we will have um, uh, another um, joint uh, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough uh, wide uh, Foundation Trust Governors meeting with the ICB ne next October, November, um, uh, in addition to the, uh, the meetings uh, that are taking place between John and the lead governors, and consideration as to how trust governors' um, issues and concerns can be best fed into um, the emerging um, structures in the ICB. Um, so um, I, I, th I think that's very positive. And that was the point that I wanted to emphasize. Thank you. Keith, I just wanted to add something in at this juncture um, because you've given uh, lots of the uh, uh, governor's reports there, but I know that Diana would wanted to talk about the student um, mental health hub and I'd rather have it now than under any other business because it seems it's an important one. So Diana by magic has suddenly put her camera on <laughs> and appeared. And I know we've also got Kathy and um, here mm -hmm. is there as well. Yeah, the only thing I'd say, Julie, um, is is that um, uh, it was Diana who asked the question. So I don't know if she's going to answer it as well. Yeah, well, I think she, <laughs> yeah, she, she wants it on there, but we, I've got Cathy and, um, and right. Kathy as well, so we can talk about it. Diana, do you just want to give people a, just a, um, an yeah. idea of where its genesis was? So I think um, that there are, there are two universities in Cambridge. Cambridge University and Anglia Ruskin and Anglia Ruskin also has a, uh, a campus in Peterborough which is currently running at about a thousand students so 
counting that with the 36,000 students in Cambridge, there's a significant uh, number of young people in the patch who are students at our two universities. Our two universities take a slightly different demographic, uh, but actually we have been working together uh, in, <clears throat> in recent months to try and uh, come up with a, a, a solution to how we can um, facilitate access to uh, mental health care for students across both universities. Um, just a bit of background from me when before I, well, a few years ago now, when I was the clinical dean at the University of Cambridge, in other words, responsible for the medical school there, um, <clears throat> we set up a clinical students' mental health service, um, which is led by Rebecca Jacob, who's a CPFT consultant. And that was to address the problems that clinical students have um, with relationship to significant mental health issues. So we're looking at in, in both, um, both in that and in what we're proposing um, at uh, significant mental health problems rather than well-being, which is something that both universities do separately, as it were. Um, <clears throat> so we set up a, a, a rapid referral system together with CPFT, which Rebecca and two of the clinical psychologists run, so that uh, clinical students who it can it can be argued they have a, a special case because they they see things as students that other students don't see and they need to be able to deal with those things so um that they are slightly different um that's been a great success with the university and cpft working together and rebecca is very keen to think about what role she might play in an extended um, student uh, hub for mental health services across Cambridge and Peterborough. Okay. So the current situation, and Anna may want to, to comment on, on, on where things have got. The current situation is that um, Cambridge University and Anglia Ruskin University have identified some funding to enable us to set this up. And that funding we would anticipate would be would go to CPFT to provide the staffing needed to support such a program. The um, integrated care board is involved, and I think I think their major concern is relating to health inequalities. And I think um, Sharon and Ember and myself have discussed this, and I think we 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 are very aware of the fact that. Um, uh, for young people who are students across our patch may actually get um, better access to mental health because of all the well-being support and the psychological support that exists in the universities than, as it were, your average 18 to 22-year-old across east of England. So we understand that and we've started to give some thought to how this could turn into a two-way process that the universities would help to put something back into the community uh, in addition to having this this service. But I think um, you'll all be aware of uh, through through the media uh, of, of the issues related to student mental health across the country. <clears throat> and we have a, a a large student population, and I think, uh, we're coming at this from the point of view that we should be able to provide a good service for those students. Um, I can stop you there and I'll just bring in Kathy. Yeah. Kathy. Sorry. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> you slipped off my Zoom screen. There you are. Kathy, you're on mute, dear. <laughs> yes. So I can give a little bit of context. So we were approached by um, Cambridge University. Uh, so Anthony Freeling um, arranged a meeting with Anna. So Anthony Freeling is the vice chancellor, acting vice chancellor of the university currently. 
Um, and basically he expressed concerns about the six suicides that occurred in the student population last year, which is very worrying, and drawing attention to the fact that um, students are here for eight weeks, um, three times a year. So the three terms, the terms are eight weeks. And actually many of these students are involved with mental health services back at home, but it's there are great difficulties trying to transit them to local services during that eight week period. And often, you know, in that process, um, bad things happen um, and they don't get the support that they necessarily need. They do have a lot of well-being support, as Diana says, but they don't always access it. And ARU are also involved and one population that they're very concerned about are particularly their male Asian students who they say really avoid um, any of the kind of interventions that they currently offer. In terms of what we've done is we read um, the university of a very good person called Natalie Acton, who's leading this piece of work for the university, and we agreed to develop a business case with them. So what we um, have looked at is the clinical school service that Diane has mentioned, which is run by Rebecca Jacob and the two psychologists, but also our staff mental health service, which people are familiar with, which we started up during COVID and basically has a rapid access um, element and um, provides um, assessment very quickly and, and keeps people at work or um, uh, also gets people off work when they shouldn't be at work. So we agree to develop a business case. What we have been very clear about is that currently in CPFT, we have workforce issues as do all trusts nationally and in the region. And therefore what we can't afford to do is to set up a service which depletes us further of our key workforce staff. So what we have suggested is that we would start with a pilot that pilot might be taking one college and providing a service uh, with a, you know, a fledgling group of staff and evaluating that over time to inform us as to what the correct clinical model is and what's actually required. But we need to be very clear that, you know, um, the workforce issue is, is very central to us. So a pilot seems the best way forward. Um, so we're at that point where that business case is being developed and it needs to sit within the trust uh, under our usual governance processes. Um, so that has yet to be identified as to where, where that piece of work will sit. It might be under transformation. Um, the directorates are obviously very um, stretched at the moment, but you know it is an encouraging thing that the universities are wanting to fund this. And it is very important that we, we support this. But it's about the practicalities really moving forward. I don't know if Debbie would like to say anything else as our operationals lead. Yeah, she's trying to find the mute button. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, thanks, Cathy. Um, yeah, I think um, you, you've summed it up well, actually. We need to just look at what capacity we've got to provide this. Nobody doubts it's a really good service and it would be very beneficial um, to the universities. Um, but um, as, as we've said, capacity is, a, is an issue and we need to really um, understand how achievable it is and how big we could make this if we can make it. Um, so there are a few steps that we need to go through internally. Now we've got the business case to just really clarify that. Yeah, well, I think this probably is a good example to the governors around how we're trying to juggle what are really good ideas with the reality of waiting lists and other such things. It's um, it's really not easy, but we all know the value. And Eileen has written in the in the chat absolutely. And we've had our own experience of students falling through the gaps and then bad things happening. So it's something that we're taking really seriously, and we're really looking to see what we can do about it. And um, we can come back with updates as to where we are at future Council of Governors meetings, but it's a good example of us trying to do the right thing while still balancing some of the other requirements on the on the on the trust. Um, and Cripper, I can talk to you offline about the Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority. They probably don't have the capability currently to do anything in terms of this. Um, they are um, not in the best shape, but they might do. They now have a new chief exec. We'll see how it goes forward, but uh, at the moment it's buses and housing that they're looking at. Um, right, let's move on to Cathy. You can have your own slot now on Children's Hospital Update. I think you must I, all have- sorry, I keep on going, I keep on pressing my, my Teams instead of my Zoom button. Oh, right, okay. um, thank you very much, Julie. So um, a very brief update really. So as people know, um, 
we submitted our um, outline business case back in December, which was a real milestone, and we were all very excited about that. Since then, what we've really focused on is a programme of work, uh, which we are um, conducting with the centre uh, in order to confirm the funding arrangements for the hospital. So we've got our element of um, uh, philanthropy that's going really well. We've got in excess of £42 million now raised in philanthropy, and that's well before going out to the public. Um, so this has all been in the in the what the, what the fundraisers called the quiet phase, which I always find a, an interesting term um, because I, I'd like to see what happens in the noisy phase. But we are ahead of schedule in terms of raising that amount of money, um, given the feasibility study that we had done at the at the very beginning. And the fundraisers remain very optimistic about us being able to to reach our target. Um, what has happened recently is that people like Scott. Uh, and partners from the University of Cambridge and UH have been in discussions with Julian Kelly. Uh, and this is about um, you know, future funding for the hospital and making sure it makes sense within our OBC. And the good news is that um, Julian Kelly has approved the drawdown of further funds to the point of 3.75 million uh, in order for us to continue that work over the next six months. Um, and um, at the end of that, uh, we will have a, a much better idea, much more detailed. Uh, sorry, Julian Kelly is National Finance Director. Um, we'll have a much more detailed understanding of the funding streams for this hospital. And then we will expect an outcome to the OBC um, in September, and that will allow us to move on with the uh, FBC. But in the meantime, we are doing work towards the FBC, in particular around clinical pathways, etc. So uh, that's good. Well, and the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is um, uh, BBC Radio 4 on their recent um, food programme. They did a, a, a particular item on hospital food, and that features um, our very own Nancy Bostock talking on behalf of the Children's Hospital and Caroline Hayes, who's a dietitian um, at CUH, and it went down very well. And it's made a, um, a it was a very nice kind of um, a uh, bit of ad advertising. So um, if any of you want to catch up with that, it's uh, available via podcast um, on uh, the BBC podcast website. So please do tune in um, and uh, listen to that. And if you were juggling OBCs and FBCs, it's outline business case and full business case. And the, Sorry, the one, yes. yeah, the one other thing that Scott mentioned was that um, the reason the teams in London, bearing in mind the money is tight, are really keen on the project is because it's the only the only project they have that actually includes mental health um so it's quite unique yeah so, we need so to the mental health up. element is really key um yeah. so we're very pleased about that yeah um so thanks kathy i mean it's, it's good progress and if you just like to know that those who remember Joe Lucas, I mean, she's not been left very long, but when she heard that podcast, she immediately texted me about food, <laughs> which was the thing that she was passionate about us improving, not just for children, but for everybody. So uh, she was um, she was definitely on it. Um, now we've got the integrated performance uh, review um, report rather from Debbie, but looking specifically at waiting list and using the data for that. Yep. Thanks, Julie. Um, so I've got four slides, which I, want, I believe are going to be shared. Um, I'm hoping somebody's got them in the corporate office so that I can just run through a quick overview of the waiting list. But while that's coming up on screen, just to say, um, you'll see um, in your pack that you've now got the new integrated performance report, the IPR. Um, and we've started to use the um, SPC charts um, as um, we talked to the governors about some time ago now and um, using that process um, to um, understand um, our performance within our waiting lists. Um, the IPR covers a lot of our performance, but particularly we've been looking at waiting lists recently to try and help to reduce those waits. And we set up a number of things along the way, including waiting list groups in each of the directorates and an overarching group called the PTL group, which is the patient tracker list group, which looks at all of the waits and goes through them individually. And what I've got for you here is just four quick slides, which I'll run through on what is happening in each of the directorates um, and where we're at. 
So um, we have seen a, um, some really positive um, reductions in the number of children and young people waiting for mental health assessments. I have to say that children and young people's directorate have been leading the way on the work with waiting lists. Um, you can see we've got the um, SPC chart here. Um, it sh it's showing that um, we have um, had a decrease in weights and actually there's been an 18.2% reduction of weights um, on for children and young people's mental health assessments since July 2022. Um, um, and um, they've really, as I say, been leading the way. Um, and the next steps for them to keep going with that is they're now starting to look at having uh, weekend and uh, evening availability clinics for, for um, patients to help clear the backlog and to give more flexibility for people. Um, but it is an ongoing um, battle, I guess, in that we are still seeing large amounts of numbers come in who require um, help, but, um, but we're trying to keep those numbers um, within the 52 week wait We'd like that to be much less, but we are continuing to work on that. So, um, and these slides can go in the chat or be circulated afterwards so that everybody can have more detail. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, older people waiting for mental health assessment. Um, they have seen um, a growth in people waiting, a 8.9% growth. Um, but, and as you can see, the waiting list um, on the chart does go up. Um, they're doing a lot of work around that this morning. We started to use that PTL patient tracker list tool so that they can be really clear about the status of people waiting um, and being able to ensure that we're um, tackling the longest waits first. Specific work in the older people's directorate around mental health is looking at the delivery of the memory assessment service. So that was paused during COVID um, and nationally um, saw a massive increase in people waiting for memory assessments, particularly during 2020 when COVID first arrived due to the um, inability to see people face to face and not to be able to do those assessments over um, teams in, in the way or the um, attend anywhere process. So um, we're really trying to um, work on that at the moment. And that is um, uh, the main area of concentration in this um, particular group of people. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, physical health um, in the uh, for adults and older people. Um, we've had a total waiting list growth of 10.5% annually, um, but overall um, a 29.9% reduction in those waiting um, over the 18 weeks. So again, positive heading in the right direction is difficult because we are seeing more people coming in, um, but we are managing to um, keep that um, under the 18 week and, and really working hard on that. Um, and again, using additional staff, putting on additional clinics um, and looking at particular services that have got really high weights. And then the final slide, please. Um, is the adult slide. Um, so we've had a growth in adults of 55.5% reported. And you can see that this has got a trend that is continuing to grow and is concerned, concerning. So we've been doing a lot of work with this group, trying to understand those weights through the patient tracking system. Um, and we do know that the large majority, actually 58% of those people waiting on this list um, are challenged with, AD, with, with needing ADHD or our class services. Um, and we know that we've got a huge gap there. There's a commissioned gap there, um, as well as a staffing gap in that it is a specialised service that needs specialised um, staff. So we're really trying to look at how we can work on that and working with the ICB about what that service might look like and how we can work with um, the wider sector, other agencies and uh, the voluntary sector to look at a different model of care for this. Um, but again, they're cleansing their data, looking and working to deal with those that are over the 52 weeks um, and um, just making sure we haven't got any further hidden weights in any of our services. Um, so it's it's going well in the sense of what we're doing, but obviously we're not seeing that impact yet. So those are just the four areas that um, we've got and the work that we've been doing and where we're at with our weights at the moment. Yeah, uh, just in terms of, there's a question from Ian around what is the actual waiting time? So I know one, you just said 52 weeks, but um, 
what is what is the it depends on which service at what time because all the services are very different so we are ensuring that all our services are um under the 72 weeks which is the national um push at the moment and that does really apply to acute trust but we've been applying the same methodology here um so we have we're not having waits longer than 72 weeks um but really depending on on what the service is depends um and on, on the people the numbers waiting and the size of the service so yeah, we're, we're all very different. So, you know, yeah. yeah. I, I was putting some replies in the chat as well. Just one question for me in terms of the ADHD particularly, have you got a, a slide which strips out ADHD and then so you can look at what you would think of as serious mental health issues? I haven't today, no, but we could. Okay. The, um, the directorate do have that and bring that to um, their... Um, assurance meeting the uh, performance meeting that they have with the executive team um, of which we will have next week and and we can see that very separately there so we are um, looking for the right assurance around those waiting lists yeah. that's just a very high level view I've given you today. And I would just say just from a from a non-exec director perspective and I presume this does this feed into Karen's um, subcommittee? <laughs> Uh, no, it feeds into, well, it does, some of it does, but mostly into BMP, the, the uh, integrated performance report. Yeah. Uh, the that, quality that, issues go into PS and Q. If we know there's an issue, if you just strip that issue out, because that's being dealt with already in a different forum, then to for them to manage the yes. less manageable would be quite an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. So what we, what we do um, from the performance assurance meetings that we have is we look at the exceptions, build those into the report that goes to PS and Q and um, BMP and have the action plans behind that. Yeah. Uh, and Rick's made a comment as well, which is, which is true, but, but it's also our, our PWS, our psychological wellbeing services are also finding greater complexity of people coming through the door. Um, so, yeah. Um, Right. Any questions, anybody? I, I, I say there have been quite a few in the chat and, and they've been answered in the chat as well. So thanks for that. Um, I don't yet have any other questions, but now move on to audit and assurance. Where I do have questions. Um, Mike. Thank you, Chair. So the meeting was some time ago, early January. And I'll take the report as read. But two updates since. Uh, the head to toe accounts, our charity, were submitted sadly two days late uh, and there's been an answer uh, to the question that was raised over that. Uh, the reason being is that BDO, our former auditors, um, couldn't get their heads around the change between what were restricted funds and what were unrestricted funds. Uh, that appears now on the Charity uh, Commission's website. Uh, there are no financial implications of that but obviously some minor reputational ones since it will stay on there until we submit next year's accounts. Um, the second one, which is the appointment of ASETs as our new external auditors, uh, we need to formally report in this Council of Governors meeting that this was approved uh, out of sequence uh, by circulation of email. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that they have been on site and uh, speaking with the Finance Department uh, they appear to be very positive and um, proactive. Uh, but as I said, time will tell. Uh, but they say they have every confidence that they will meet the 30th of June deadline, which is the one set by NHS, and obviously next January when we have our uh, charity deadline. Other than that, I'm happy to take further questions. Yeah. No, we, we definitely always will put the anything decided by email goes into the next minute. So thanks, Mike, for that. The I mean, if it, hopefully people, you needn't read the whole report, just read the conclusion of the HFMI, which is the Healthcare Financial Management Association on audit. In a nutshell, on the conclusion, it tells you exactly the state of their view of the audit market currently, which is what um, uh, colleagues have been talking about uh, uh, up until now around it's a very fraught area. Um, and maybe it's the public sector that needs to change its view. But actually, if, if our new auditors um, meet the mark, maybe there isn't any need to go to one of the big four, which um, is where some of the issues have come in terms of costs and uh, processes and people to actually support, or e even the second tier below the big four. Yeah, and, and just to point out, NWAF also uh, tried to appoint auditors uh, in this last year and failed and went back to KPMG, their current auditors, cap in hand, 
and persuaded them reluctantly to do it for one more year. But they will face the same problem, uh, as did our colleagues in CCS, who have appointed a, a fairly local southwest of England firm. Uh, since the it's recruiting staff that nobody wants to become an auditor, yeah. which I sympathise as I left auditing 50 years ago. <laughs> And if anybody out there is an auditor, we love you dearly. So, <laughs> um, okay, people safety and uh, quality. Karen. Thank you. Good evening, all. I will take the papers read, but what I do want to know is the meeting is from the 14th of December. Um, and we've had three meetings since then as we've moved to monthly meetings. So, a significant amount has moved on since the meeting in December. Due to the um, pending strike action, we had to make some urgent changes to the format of the meeting, and some of the items were discussed in conjunction with um, uh, in conjunction with business and performance meeting. Um, I, I was going to touch upon the IPR, um, the Integrated Performance Report, but I think Debbie's done a be better job of that than I could have mentioned um, back, back in what we were discussing in December. What I will say, um, in terms of what we were looking at in December, we are seeing the fruits of that now, which you've just heard from Debbie. Um, we, we did seek assurance in that improvements were made with the focus but were concerned about the inconsistencies and the shared um, learning across directorates. But even from what I've just heard today, it's clear demand is different, but patient profile is different, um, acuity is different. Um, so, you know, I'll probably seek more assurance from what I've just heard than I did at the time. Um, in terms of the only, what else do I want to mention? The quality report, which I think you're going to go hear, hear about from Penny today. Um, at the time, December, there were still gaps in data, but what we've been seeing month on month is a significant improvement of the data that we are getting presented, and thus the conversations and the um, challenges and assurances we are getting from directors with the visibility of that data. Um, you're going to hear, what was it, the community mental health service, I know there is a question on that. Um, yes, concerned about the level of feedback that we were seeing in quarter two um, and the demographic information of people who provided that fee feedback, highlights of initiatives and some examples of positive feedback. However, responses were low, weekend and evening schools um, negative. Um, and so it's a matter of we, we were disappointed at the meeting that the paper, it did not set it out any mitigations or recommendations. But no doubt we'll hear a bit more about that. You're going to hear about the Cavell re review. And again, three months ago to where we are now, significant progress has been made. Still would like assurance around what difference some of all this activity is being made. But no doubt um, Stephen will talk about that in a bit more detail. So I'll stop there and open up to questions which I believe there are a few yeah I'll ask the questions and some of them you may have given answer to I mean first of all is a question saying according to the NHS employers website and this is for you and Penny to answer jointly so you can decide between the two of you who's going to do it the level one patient safety training was introduced in November 2021 and in Penny's email week beginning the 20th of March it says it only takes 30 minutes to complete and yet four out of ten staff have yet um, to fight or have only completed it, bearing, bearing in mind that means six out of 10 haven't completed it. So I think the issue is it's mandatory training. Um, what's our approach to that? Do you want to comment I, I, on that, Penny? Yeah. Yeah, so I can take that. So yeah, it was um, launched in November, 2021. Some delays as we were going through wave two and three of the COVID pandemic, the ICB gave us a target of reaching everybody in the CMP system 55% by the end of March. We've obviously made significant progress um, since this report that you've seen, uh, largely because we did make it mandatory. So we're now up just over um, 40 percent. Um, so um, we've done a, a big push for the next two weeks. So we're going to be just under or around um, uh, that target. We're actually ahead of other trusts in, in, in the system, um, uh, which we kind of keep up to date through a community of practice. 
um, and we will carry on um, obviously pushing that um, for um, uh, compliance. And as I said, it is mandatory moving forward now. So when did it become mandatory? Uh, we made it mandatory, I think, in January. Okay. So in essence, we've had sort of six weeks of mandatory and it's, yeah, okay. And although it sounds easy just to say staff should make 30 minutes, it's not always that easy to, to find the 30 minutes in so the day. It's not it's easy and, and we're balancing asks around the other um, range of statutory and mandatory supervision uh, uh, training, but we're also asking around sexual safety training um, and a range of other training too within um, a challenging operational um, um, a scenario. We have been quite um, uh, kind of innovative in terms of doing group training or using the e-learning um, uh, project. So we have been thinking out of the box in terms of how we can get as many people as possible to go through the training. And the other thing to reassure on is that actually staff don't start from base zero and need this to be effective in terms of patient safety. This is like refresher for many staff and just to get them to rethink the issues through. Yes, it, it, it focuses on a human factor, it's like a system yeah. approach. Basically. Yeah, okay. But um, we can give further updates on that um, as it gets bedded in as mandatory and hopefully we'll burst through the 60% yeah. because uh, that's important. Um, given the, the statistics, uh, I think that's that's all covered. A question from, the, from a member of the public, the Department of Health estimated in 2020 that unused medicines were a big cost. Um, I suppose the issue here is how are our pharmacy department ensuring that they don't add to unnecessary cost and they're actually effectively using their um, the drugs that they actually have? Kathy, I'm afraid I can't really answer that, Julie. I didn't spot that as a question. Um, yeah, I've, okay. I've got a bit of an update, Julie, because yeah, yeah. Um, I um, or Stephen contacted. I think we don't just say that. Yeah, so, so, so Stephen contacted our chief pharmacist, Claire Mundell. So um, it's slightly different for us in that we don't have so in, in primary care in in the the. Um, with your GP, um, there's a lot of wasted medicines um, produced by the um, uh, repeat prescriptions system and process and people end up with a lot of medicines in their home that then become wasted we don't have that same process either you know for our inpatients or also for our community patients and um, we have all of the usual good practices in place for um, those patients who are with us so when patients are admitted we have a medicines reconciliation program we only provide um, and supply as much medicine as needed so you know for how, how long we think people are going to be there or until their next medication review you. Um, and then we are able to recycle some medicines where they're not used, not patients own, um, but some medicines we're able to recycle. So all of that good practice is in place, the same as you would see in any acute trust. But by nature and by virtue of um, the way we prescribe, um, we tend to have fewer uh, wasted anyway, because people don't um, uh, they, they don't have the same opportunity to kind of hoard and, and, and stock up their medicines in the same way. Yeah, and, and actually, if there are, if there are non-exec director visits to the pharmacy, and make sure that you put your hand up and come with us if you are a governor who's interested, because you'll see that actually the amount of drugs compared to many places is really quite low and very well managed. So it's, um, it's, it's, we're, not, we're not like others um, because we don't necessarily give out drugs. People would rather not do that. Rick, uh, sorry, I didn't see your hand because there's nothing here to show that the hands are up and it's, you have a very pale hand against a white window. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and colour it up next time. Um, yeah. to be more visible. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go back to the surf uh, training that Penny was mentioning. It, it's, my comment is probably more, well, equally a cultural, and we're coming on to culture later, but just as I just wanted to just briefly show a, or make a comment about a case study to, to illustrate what I think is achievable, um, given the time frame that SURF is, is working with. So I work in the pharma industry. Um, patient safety training is also mandatory in, in the pharma industry for all staff. And it, it is a cultural non-negotiable. The refresher training is updated annually and staff must recertify each year within 30 days of the new training being released. The pass rate for the training required is 100%. 
the company I work with has 83,000 employees and they achieve 96% within 30 days. The first item on their staff appraisal, unsurprisingly, mm -hmm. is have you done your safe patient safety training? The first element on staff onboarding is patient safety. The first agenda item for project meetings, all project meetings, is patient safety. And even suppliers to the pharma industry, of which I am one, which is how I know this stuff, are required to complete that same safety training in the same 30 day time period. And you don't work for that company unless that training is done. So I'm just querying whether the targets that we've been allowed by the ECB, I get that we've been given that target, but I'm querying saying that the good news is I believe it's possible to achieve an awful lot more than the figures that we have driven at the moment. Okay. I think we'll just take that as an example and a comment. I don't think we're going to discuss that, Rick, but I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, but my question, I suppose, to you would be, does your pharma industry deal with patients on a daily basis, as in the interaction with patients on a ward, et cetera? Absolutely. That's what, what, what goes on in clinical trials. Yeah, but it's quite different, isn't it? Well, that's one example. I could give you dozens. I could give you dozens. Yeah, OK. Understood. Um, let me ask the next question in terms of the Community Mental Health Service user survey results, which are poor um, in the governor's eyes. And PSQ minutes state that the paper has no had no mitigations or recommendations. I think you slightly covered this, Karen. But what assurance have we got there's a suitable plan in place for the service? So I can take that one as well, Karen. Okay, so um, so a full, I've requested a full improvement plan that's being um, presented to our newly formed patient experience and engagement committee um, next week, and it will come up to PSQ uh, the month after. Um, some of the um, actions or, or areas of improvement, for example, care planning um, and care coordination are included in the quality priorities for, for next year. So um, we have try to kind of make sure there's that golden thread through everything that we're doing um but we will uh, karen will get sight of that next month okay and that's how it's being kept on the radar it's coming regulated ps and q yeah and this the next question that somebody asked was actually this was also answered at board yesterday but we didn't have kathy and so she might actually have a view in terms of um clinical effectiveness dashboard showed that only 30% of young people have a confirmed mental health diagnosis. And Cathy, I mentioned that um, uh, chess would often wax lyrical on this, although she had a high target, it's something that's really quite difficult to do. Um, and you don't necessarily want to, people want a diagnosis, but treat, but actually coming to a diagnosis is, is sometimes easier said than done. Do you no, want to I would agree with that. And, and diagnoses in young people are often very fluid. So we often see something that might look like a psychosis turn into a bipolar disorder as, as the child um, ages. So I think there, there is a reluctance to, to pigeonhole children with diagnostic labels when it's not entirely clear. So sometimes it is very clear, but I think that often it isn't. Um, so I, I would agree with Chess's previous. Um, and, and, you know, we tend to look at um, needs-led assessments as well. So with children, they will have different areas of need and of difficulty. And it's really about targeting those. Um, and if that adds up to a diagnostic group of um, symptoms, which you're targeting, that's very helpful. But but otherwise, the, the important thing is to get on with looking at those needs and addressing them. Okay. And then there was a question also around um, having separate data and charts. I think the, the, the essence around this is not to look at diagnosis through data and charts but actually having a conversation about it um i don't know who actually asked that question if there's anything that they particularly want to know in terms of adults and and uh, and older people's mental health services but it's quite complex diagnosis it's not that it's right or wrong jane yes that 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 question came from me um and uh, I, I, it's speaking for a lot of parents um, that have also gone through community CAMs, that the, the lack of willingness to make accurate diagnoses, um, you know, many of us feel it is not the right thing to do. It would be possible. 
um, the, the symptoms are there and they might link to better treatments if they were given the right diagnosis. So to see it so egregiously below a target tells me either we need a proper discussion about that policy, a wide discussion, um, and if the discussion is agreeing with Cathy, and I personally vehemently disagree with her because you know, even our coroner believed that killed my children, um, then I think we need to change the target and not tell people to reach 90 and have them completely ignore it and think that 30 is okay. So something is wrong there. Um, you know, if I lose the argument, then the target needs to be separated from the adults and older people and set lower. Um, but I think we should have a policy debate, not just accept one graph that amalgamates two organisations almost meeting the target and one way below. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. I think I think it's probably best to have a conversation outside and then we can bring it back um, and have a presentation if required. OK, exactly. Thank you, Thank you Jane. Right. Well, let's move on well I'll just put the agenda down um Joan who I've seen sitting there for ages um along with um Stephen is going to talk about the cultural review and staff survey Stephen thanks. are you starting and then Joan handing to Joan yeah you are yeah I am thanks very much Julian apologies everybody I I had COVID recently I'm still coughing and choking so apologies um what we're going to do Sorry, my watch said when you spoke, I don't understand. So clearly my watch doesn't, I'll turn it off. I'll do something with it. <laughs> we're doing well tonight, Julie, aren't we? I know. So basically what we're going to do is you've got a paper which was in the pack. Now that paper was um, from January. Um, and we do feel it's really important to talk through with the Council of Governors, you know, what's been happening since January. And also at the same time, we've had the staff survey results come out. And the staff survey results basically reflect a period in time which was last October into November. Uh, and if you recall, the, um, the cultural review, and we're now calling it the Shaping Our Future programme, um, that was released um, mid to late November. So there's a lot of synergy between what the staff survey says and what we found in the cultural review as well. So we've done some slides that we're going to run through because I said I think it's really important just to just to bring people up to date on what's been happening and what we're hearing back from staff as well around some of the some of the listening events that we've been doing. And Joan will talk that through. And then Joan will also talk through just some of the sort of the staff survey results as well. And again, um, we had a sort of a, a, a healthy conversation yesterday at board around the staff survey as well. I'll hand across to Joan. Thank you. And um, Natalie, could we have the slides, please? Um, but just whilst um, Natalie's doing that, just to say thank you to Keith for, for asking that I, I come along. It's just a, a great pleasure to, to have culture on so many agendas. Um, if, we, if we start with that as ground zero, we've ne I've never in any organisation spoken so much about the culture, so, which is really, really healthy. So um, Thank you for the invite. Sorry we didn't get to meet at Peterborough at the Cavell Centre, but we know that was postponed um, because of the junior doctors um, strike. So um, as, as, as Stephen said, I'm, uh, next slide please, I'm really going to give, there's, there's more detail in this slide deck and Chair, please don't be alarmed, I will, <laughs> I'm not going to go through all of the slides, but it's there for you for later to, to, have, a, to have a good look at. I'm hoping I, I can be quite pacey, but please either stop me or ask questions of myself, Stephen, Anna, or if indeed all of the execs. Um, but I can't see anyone. So if you um if you want to say something, will you just just shout? I won't be, I won't, I won't be offended. Um and I'll happily go back if you need me to. Next slide, please. So just to give some con some context, really, and I think it's it's probably highlighted um, in, in all of the conversation today that we are the health service and, and indeed CPFT have been under e extreme pressure over the last couple of years. And we're still under pressure with, um, as we've heard, waiting lists, capacity, competing demands, etc. And as Stephen said, the staff survey, along with the cultural review, um, has, has made us think that we really have to have a concerted effort, really shine the light on the culture of the organisation. And that's why indeed I was employed for a short period of time to, to, to just guide, shine that light and um, start to shape the future um, over the, ne the next few months and start to get develop those plans that people have actually 
bought into and um and, and, and want and want to progress the agenda and that's something that we're we're feeling much more now we people were in a different place maybe in november and now people are saying yep yeah, come on this is within within all of our grasp we can do something um around around culture so next slide please and this next slide just highlights if we need it but what culture is and what what the um what the king's fund say about culture and the characteristics that are fundamental to a healthy culture and just to to reassure you that all of these elements are right through our action plans and our um, ambitions to improve the culture within the organization next slide please one of the things um, that we started off immediately doing was talking to staff at the cavell center um, and i just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the the conversations so when they were asked and what was great about working in the organisation, just to give some balance to it, people talked about teams, relationships and the support that they get from each other. And what, what we're desperately trying to do now is to have a much more consistent response to that so that everyone feels each day that they come to work that they are valued within their team, they have good trusting relationships and they're supported by their management to get on and do their, to do their role. Next slide, please. And this slide said, well, what else can we be doing from where we are now? So people were saying, listening up. It's, it's, a, it's a term that we use. We, um, we, we ask people to speak up, we listen up, and then we follow up. And I think you, you'll see with that action um, standing out that we have actually seen an increase in people speaking up, and that's really, really positive. And now as an organisation, we have to have the resource in place to, to respond well to people who speak up. Um, it's better that people speak up rather than hide and you know or maybe just have apathy that they think well there's no point in speaking up so we're continuing the conversations but this is was kind of finalizing some more of the diagnostics so that we move into the the planning phase and shaping the future about um, how how we shape the organization going forward next slide please I won't go through all of these there are three pages full and it was good to hear Karen say earlier that there has been a significant amount of progress. There has been a significant amount of progress. Whether we can say hand on heart today that everyone's experience at the Cavell and moving on from the Cavell, but there are other people in the organisation's experience will have changed. I don't know that we can measure it that quickly. But what I do know is that we're talking to people, they're getting involved. Our leaders are involved and we're starting to shape a future together that we all want. And I think we're getting to a place where we all feel it's our responsibility and we have to be very careful that culture is not being developed um, in isolation of, of um, the rest of the organisation. So hopefully me talking there, you've seen some of the, the progress um, from the Cavell Centre. One of the main things was that we set up a project um, structure and governance um, and that's to bring assurance all of the time. And we have our, we'll be having our third programme board um, on Monday and um, we we'll give a lot of focus there to ED and I, um, especially on, on Monday and communication. So next slide, please. And so progress is continuing and we there's a focus on leadership and culture. There's a focus on multidisciplinary team working. And that's really important to say that we've seen the improvement around patient safety instant um, reporting. And Penny will say that that was already in progress. But again, just shining the light has, you know, given a little bit more impetus to that. And that's um, that framework is finalised and, and is being launched. And um, the clinical forum that was for adult services, a direct response to the feedback that we had. Um, from that diagnostic around MDT, multidisciplinary um, team working and consultants always being involved. So that's a direct, you know, it's happened, it's in place and it's working exceptionally well. Um, next slide, please. And again, there's, here's some other areas that we're focusing on, on workforce. We've um, the immediate um, sort of audits, reviews of, of current processes and practices has been undertaken and we're we're working with with others now to ensure that what we say we do we embed and that we follow our own processes and that we make our processes easy for people to do the right thing 
Um, so that's the, that's some of um, the learning and we're not taking anything for granted. So when people say to us, yep, that's in place, we say, show me. And um, we're looking we're looking for, for real assurance that our, our own processes are being are being followed. And um, we're going to focus a bit more now on EDI, and i um, equality, diversity and inclusion. There has been some gaps there and we're really pleased. Um, Debbie and I spoke this afternoon and Debbie's been doing um, work there to ensure that we um, bridge some gaps with some experts to come and to come and help us with that with that agenda, which is really, really important, which is one of which has been highlighted also in our staff survey as a, a gap. It's not consistently good across the organisation. So um, it's really important that we focus on that. And the other thing that comes up time and time again is around trust and relationships. We've seen that in the staff survey also around people's um, the relationship um, with their staff and their relationship and whether they feel valued by their manager too. So um, that's something else that we really we're going to um, focus and put some e effort and energy into. Um, you know, it can be things like induction, how how you how you welcome people, how you continually support people, how you're inclusive um, in everything you do. Next slide, please. And so this, I'm really sorry that this slide hasn't um, transferred as, as well as I'd hoped, but we just wanted to, to share a little bit of the staff survey and really that says that we, we started off with the Cavell Centre, but actually this programme now is trust wide and it's shaping our future. And we didn't have the best results. Um, we can we can say that they're relative to others, but from our perspective, we can, we feel as though we can do better and we want to do better. So what you can't see, so on the left hand side is a scale of zero to ten, and um, the the code at the bottom here is amber is the worst organisation. So the, the amber um, horizontal line is the worst organisation. Um, the green line is the best organization. The dark blue um, vertical line is CPFT. So you really want to be focused on the blue line, the dark blue line, CPFT, and the pale blue line um, column is the average. So this is um, how we um, sort of shape up against the people promises that everyone in the NHS is measured against and two additional um, lines on staff engagement and morale. Um, and the, the big picture there is we're below average um, in all of them. You, you can see that we're not the worst. We're certainly not going to be the best, but we are below average. So um, so there's there, there's there's work to be done across a full range of, this, of, of those themes. Next slide, please. So this um, this shows how we've compared to last year. And um, again, for the for the most part, um, we've stayed the same. There's been one imp one improvement, but there have been some situations where our, our ratings um, have have been lower. Um, so you'll see the, the line there for the 2021 score and the 2022 score. The main thing to comment on, which I think speaks volumes um, around where we are, perhaps or where we were, um, was that we had a very low response rate. And that's normally first indication around how engaged people are. I mean, we should expect next year that we have more people responding and maybe maybe worse scores, but it's better that people, there's not that apathy there that people are, that feel that it's worthwhile to respond to the survey and the like. So that, that was just to, to see how we compare ourselves, but also, just to confirm that it's really not just the cabal that we're that we're looking at. Next slide, please. And this just sort of, if people like colours, um, green's good and red red's bad. And where the top left um, boxes is, is where we're better better than the average picker for people who don't know the organisation that we use in many NHS organisations use picker. Um, to undertake the survey so we can come they have their data that we can compare ourselves to um, to other NHS um, health and care organizations so you can see where um, we were better than average in that top right um, bottom left where we've improved that, that's not to say we're sitting back in our laurels there that's where we've improved and um, we can build on those improvements and understand what it is that we've done um, to get those improvements and then top right, top uh, bottom right in the red, 
um, really talks about um, talks about really appraisals in there. That's come up a couple of times today, hasn't it? Around where we're, where we're not doing so well and um, whether people feel valued, appraisal left me feeling uh, valued. We can we can definitely do better. We're below average. That's what that's saying. It's we're below average, and then we've had um, some scores that are more, most declined as well. And in a context of satisfied with levels of pay, we get paid the same as other organisations. So um, you know we're um, it, it's gone down, but that's probably a, a, a national thing to people being able to to comment on that. Um, probably the only other thing to say, you know, without getting into huge detail on the survey, is that there is trust-wide variation. So that gives us that gives us hope <laughs> because it works. It's not as bad in every in every team in every department. And what we are looking for is a consistent experience for people at work, um, for all staff. So it's not dependent. It's not a postcode lottery to uh, coin a phrase. It's it's not dependent on where you're actually working. Um, we, we want all of our staff to get the best possible ex experience at work. Next slide, please. And um, this is just to take you to a place where we have started to have conversations. And we, we I was invited today with Anna and, um, and, and Andy and Ashton to talk to staff with the Anna's session that she has on a Thursday. And we started to talk about how everyone has got a role in shaping the culture. We talked about what is culture and it's, you know, how you feel on a Sunday night. It's how you feel about going into a team, how well supported you are, et cetera. But we did talk in more detail about role modelling and how we behave when the spotlight's on and when the spotlight's off and what people see, what people would say about us. And um, so we did touch, touch on role modelling, but we also um, talked about how we communicate and how we ensure people are can make sense of what's being asked of them. And that's that thing about roles and responsibilities and conviction. Um, so these, this is the kind of building blocks that we want to work with the organisation. So it's that I'll change my mindset, I'll change my behaviour when I see, when I see role models that mirror our values. I will change my behaviour when I understand what's being asked of me. I'll change my behaviours when the policy and the process supports me. So it kind of goes back to maybe even Rick's point um, earlier about patient safety training. You know, what is it? What's the reinforcing mechanism that will ensure? And how much time do we give people to do training? There are lots of questions to be asked, but it's these, these quadrants and building blocks that we want, want to start to use. And the other thing, of course, is that we always go not when something goes wrong, we say we need to develop people and we need to we need, we need to have the skills. Yes, we do. But it's part of the part of the, the building blocks. So there's no point in sending people and developing them, developing skills if nothing else changes. And um, so we want to be able to um, to use to use that to use that model. And people are people are clicking into the model. They, they, they get it. And today um, it was it was really refreshing when I went to another um building I went over to the resource centre because we had the autism um, um, day today and um, people were saying somebody had said I, I saw it and I'm going to do this differently so that was that was fantastic so it's just to, to share some of the, the models and the building blocks that we've got next slide please not long to go not long to go and um, so this is just I just wanted to reassure people that our main focus is going to be as I've mentioned improved staff experience it's going to be on leadership and creating and developing communities of leaders not one-off training and I've shared that with the um the board as well they were they were pleased to hear to hear that as well and then creating and developing that culture of um conclusion just where everyone can thrive and and, and, and broader than the protected characteristics around everyone feeling that they've got a voice they can be heard and and that they're valued but I wanted to reassure you that that is absolutely um, aligned to our strategy, the, the top right, which is around people at the heart of everything we do, and it's not an it's it's not an either or. So again, organisationally, we need to think about have we do we have the right balance? Are we talking and you know when we talk performance? Are we talking about the health of the organisation as well? And we're talking about the culture. So that was just to 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 reassure you that these things um, are aligned. Um, next slide, please. Um, I won't go into this in detail, but it'll be there for you. It's just some of the areas that we've got further development um, to do. We're going to, we've got a face-to-face -face, um, session with 
the whole of our top leadership team in a couple of weeks and um, we're going to be using those building blocks and start to think about where we where we spend where we put our energy and that's twofold it will engage people they'll feel as though they're shaping it and we'll get buy-in and when there's buy-in, um, the transformational change will be much more successful, we hope. And next slide, please. And this is just to say that the, the next phase, that phase two now, um, will be around creating momentum. And there's a piece of work that we're hoping to um, commission around just revisiting our values and staff charter. It's one of those things, we have all of these things, they're laminated on many walls, but do, do we live our values and do we, um, our, our behaviours um, as we set out in our staff charter? So we're going to do something that will really gather momentum, make it a social movement working right across the organisation so that everyone feels involved in shaping our future together and just to get that support and buy-in. Then we're going to look at um, the things that are shaping up are around focus on teams and supporting and developing high performance teams and functional teams. And then a um, big piece of work around ED&I um, and progressing that. And then I think Karen mentioned around, you know, KPIs and how do we demonstrate, you know, the change. I think that will come. We have anecdotal information about people feeling better. Certainly people are much more engaging. And we're doing all of the things that people have suggested that are the right things to do, none least the 23 recommendations in the... Um, in the diagnostic that was that was done so there's, there's there's more to do to clarify that ambition but I think we want to be ambitious as well we don't want mediocre we don't want to just get by because people don't buy into mediocrity and um, so we want to have be ambitious and um, focus and do some more deep dives into to areas that we've, you know we might have ticked the box to say we've done the initial review really what else can we be doing so that could be recruitment it could be around just in learning culture what just in restorative culture what does that really really mean and then the, the sort of wider um, work that we need to do is around large-scale organizational health and that's that balancing performance and health of the organization and that links with strategy for the next for the next few years next slide and that I'm really I'm really finished I'm really happy to take questions um any of the team are and your observations your comments and i could see things were coming through but I, i've not been able to multitask i'm afraid on that so you might just have to help me with some of the questions thank you very much thanks thanks joan they're not really questions there's been a conversation that's been going on in the side which i, I would ask everybody to have a look and read because it's actually a really good conversation that's been going through because um as you've been going along Stephen and and um uh, and Anna have actually been answering those mm -hmm. questions and, and a, a couple of really good points I mean Andrea Hill does say processes which we all know need to be there but they're only as important as the they, they are important but they're only as good as the people who enact them and I, and I say that in terms of you know one thing that came out culturally really clearly was we need to know that recruitment is fair and I think that is so important if you start to turn that people will then think, yeah, they're making a difference. So, you know, all the words on the paper won't make a difference. It's like, you know, they'd be unfairly treated. So. And, yeah, thank you. And we, I absolutely agree that. And the, the process needs to ensure that there's no room for human error or yeah. that people can't bypass the process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, and they get feedback and it's honest and open feedback. Yeah, because yeah. not everybody can get a job. We all know it's often- No, sadly, sadly yeah. not. Yep. Yeah. Um, and Eileen was just saying it's incredibly important to have these conversations ongoing, really. And keep yeah, thinking. yeah. But there, there is a good conversation. I recommend. I'm sure people were looking at it and double tasking because I know if you're presenting, <laughs> it's very hard to double task. Ian, you put your hand up. Yeah, I mean this is anecdotal, but I've been at the Cavell Centre as a volunteer for uh, a long time, and I've been in the last few weeks, and I've chatted informally and confidentially, confidentially with some of the staff. And they say things are better than they were. <laughs> so oh, that is, as I say, is anecdotal, but you know. Yeah. And, and I know that's not going to give everyone the assurance that we absolutely know that we need. But that is actually, Ian, thank you for sharing that, because that is actually how it feels. Um, we've, we know where we've got pockets. We know where we need to work. But I think the attention 
um, the involvement and, um, and, and, and another, it was not, it was more than anecdotal, but we had a situation where, and I think I might have told the board this, but we um, had a situation where we couldn't recruit a psychologist. It was really difficult to recruit a psychologist at the Cavell Centre. The report came out and when people saw, you know, Stephen and Kathy and Anna, it, they are speaking about it. Somebody from the south um, of the, the patch contacted the psychologist in, in Cavell to say, I've never wanted to work in Cavell, but now that you know what's going on there and I can see the passion, I'm going to apply for that job. So we thought, you know, or I'm presuming the organisation thought, this, might, this is going to hit us hard with recruitment. But in actual fact, the attention paid to it and the... the, the the genuine desire to improve things has actually has yeah. actually worked really quickly. Yeah, actually, it's, if you if people know about motivation theory, it's the Hawthorne effect. Bad things can have as much of a positive impact as good things. Um, uh, just before I bring in Stephen, um, I, th I think you know uh, the other point that Eileen made is around setting expectations with managers, and that in, in essence, some of it. It goes back to the point that Rick was making earlier about what do we expect. And I think Penny is actually already setting those and we'll need to see how those advance. Um, well, I think Penny and team, but the, in particular in respect to that. And Ed says the notable low scores in response to we are always learning. Do we have an insight into what staff most want to learn? Is it clinical skills, is it leadership skills? Or is it just that they're not quite sure what skills they want to learn, but they know they have an objective to get to X in their career and they're not quite sure what to do in the pathway? Mm. Oh, can I answer that one, Julie? Oh, go on then. Yeah. Have you got your hand up? I was going to bring you in next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so I think in relation to Ed's question, it depends on the, de the demographic. I mean, I would urge people to do a couple of things. First of all, look at the board report um, from yesterday. There's a lot more detail in that board report around the staff survey and go on the national staff survey um, 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 portal. And then you can really get into some of the detail there because actually from appraisal perspective, even though technically we're still below the average, actually the feedback on appraisal has actually increased. It's got better, but actually if you then get into the demographics, it's got better for everybody who's 31 and above but if you're a younger person and you want that career and you want that planned out and you want to have that really, you know, clear, objective driven sort of conversation. And what do I need to do? Actually, your feedback to us has been, do you know what? You're not doing this particularly well. And therefore, you really do need to think about us as a younger group. So it's really interesting to get to some of that detail. The two things I was going to say then is really communication. There is something very much around communication, how we communicate what we are doing back to staff. So one of the challenges of us at PS and Q was very much around having five clear messages that we can go out and we can talk with staff. Because you say, you know, what is the impact on staff on the ground? Well, we're getting anecdotal evidence feedback that actually things are changing and it's for the positiveness. And again, if you look at the staff pulse survey that we do on a quarterly basis in the staff survey, it was like 54 percent said we'd recommend you as a place to work. Actually, in the pulse survey, it's now 66 percent. So, you know, things are sort of changing in the right direction. And I think my final point was going to be, this is going to take some time. We've done some really quick, immediate actions. We've done some sort of medium term type actions. We've still got a lot more to do. And as Joan said, we've still got to go back and check. Actually, we've got some of this right, because we might not have done. So we might need to sort of alter this again. But this sort of stuff does take time as well. So I think it's just about managing those expectations. And I think we're quite clear through PS and Q that we will be monitored on a monthly basis. Uh, and I think that's really important. Yeah, I suppose from a Ned Assurance perspective, I could let Karen speak for herself. Um, but I'm sure she'd say, you know, words are fine. She's looking to make sure the action actually follow the words. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, she lent forward and now she lent back again. Andrea. <laughs> Andrea. Thanks yeah. very much. That was exactly where I was coming from, really. Um, wanting to say to Karen, I, I know your mantra will be prove it. And <laughs> I know at the beginning we need to put in, but we have to have a process and we need to put in the processes and we need to check that the processes are happening. But how are we actually measuring that there's a difference? Because I'm not convinced by the staff survey. I'm not saying it's not important, but the conversations that people have within an organisation aren't necessarily captured by a 
either of a formal response to management because we'll be creating an expectation that people will answer in a particular way. So, I mean, I actually quite like the anecdotal evidence, I, mm. particularly when it doesn't come from somebody feeding to a manager. I think that's important. But how, Karen, are you thinking about assurance? Karen? Um, I think like you, and I don't disagree, that change in a culture takes time. Um, we've got the programme plan and there are lots of work streams in there about action completed, action completed. Firstly, I'd like to see, OK, it's completed. So what? What difference has that made? And I'll start. I want to see that tracking through um, as we as Neds go out and about and talk. Similarly, has just been alluded to there. We will be asking questions. What are they seeing, feeling that is different? Has it made a difference to them? And that's across the whole trust and some of that will be anecdotal and some will be hard evidence and as the boss has just said you know the, the recruitment process now audits have been done okay what difference are we now going to see in, re in recruitment processes that staff can see hear and feel and know is different so what it looks like um, Andrew in terms of being assured will vary depending on what it is but you know I want to see evidence yeah. see it hear it or feel it so it isn't actually with Ned's just relying on um, data coming back. I mean, that's part of the picture, but actually now we're back out looking at what's going on in services. Um, you start to feel it. And, uh, you know, people are honest and open if you're honest and open with them. So um, it is nice when Ian gets it, uh, the feedback, because that's that's really helpful. Um, but I, I've never seen staff holding back when. No. Yeah. Uh, Anna and then Anthony. The, the, uh, so, so I suppose it really to, to build on what Karen was saying, and I absolutely um, a, a agree, you know, as execs, we can't be everywhere all at once either. So we need to rely on what, what we're seeing and, and hearing and, and feeling too. And, and actually, you know, thank you, Ian. I think we, we, Joan and I were actually holding our breath. You kept us on tender hooks before you actually gave us the feedback. But we need to hear it because... Um, you know, we, we need to hear all of the feedback from as many different sources as, as possible and, and governors and, and, and non-execs are as much a great source of feedback as, you know, the information we get. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I go out and about in the organisation, you know, as much as I can, I get loads of positive feedback. People rarely give me the negative stuff to my face. So it's really important that we, we able to, we're able to sort of triangulate and, um, it's that whole mixture of quantitative and qualitative data because when you're measuring something around culture it's both which are just important as important and you know we can provide hard evidence around the inputs but the softer evidence is more around um the impact that it's having and the the output so i, I think it, it's not an exact science i guess is 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 my thoughts on that and from the governor perspective, I know she's been off having an operation, but um, Nora is a sanctuary in the Cavell and people go and see and speak to her regularly. So you do have that level of assurance, stroke reassurance from a governor perspective is on the ground, feeling it and seeing it and actually goes elsewhere in the organisation as well. So it's probably worth having a having a conversation with Nora. Anthony. There you are, sorry. Yes, I actually put on my notes qualitative and quantitative data. So <laughs> get me to the front from there. Um, as a former market researcher, I can tell you the importance of both. If you don't have a balance between them, you end up getting half the picture. Quantitative mm -hmm. data is excellent. It's wonderful for analysis. It's wonderful for statistical um, purposes. But you also need qualitative data because you need to understand the person behind it. And also sometimes you might not be asking the right question. So sometimes having the ability in a form to have an open, would you like to express any comments on this subject is a great way to, for example, find a repeating issue or to highlight a concern that's only in one department, for example. Um, the other thing is chicken and the egg when it comes to this. <clears throat> it, it, I agree, you can't fix um, a problem in a, uh, in a network or in an institution overnight. Um, and it is difficult to say to someone, for example, who is, say, 30, 40, 50% down in their department on staff, 
things are going to change. We're recruiting because it takes time for those results to feed back and for those people to be trained and for them to come in. Um, so I can understand why, for example, if I was going to a certain department where they were overstretched, it, it's difficult for them to understand that obviously this work is being undertaken. Um, but I do think reinforcing that and sending out the message that efforts and time are continually being taken on this is the best approach because eventually over time they will see the positive results of what um, the CPFT is trying to do. Thanks Anthony, very helpful. Um, I think we'll bring it to a close there and, and Joan's just said thank you as well. Um, so I think Joan probably what's best to do and it will probably be after, well, well it will be when I'm gone because this is my last council of governors meeting, but I think governors would appreciate you coming back in a, in a couple of sessions time. I know that next time I think you're on leave. So, but actually, you know, you can have too much of a good thing. So maybe the one after would be nice to give them an update on where we are. Okay. And, and clearly you and Karen will definitely triangulate, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks very much for your time. And um, we'll move on with the next section. I can see Jeff already anticipating and coming off mute. <laughs> Over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Thank you, Jeff. Julie. Thanks, Julie. Good, e good evening, everyone. So in respect to the Business Performance Committee, just to put some context around, the meeting we held on 15th of December was the day before the um, uh, industrial action in December. So it was a 45 minute meeting. And then we had the remainder on the 13th of January. So what I'm going to do is just give you, whilst the report is specifically talking about the December meeting, the context of over and above the assurance aspects, I just wanted to draw the Council of Governors attention to really two areas of discussion. The first was around, it touches upon um, what Debbie was talking about earlier, which is looking through the really, really focusing in after the IPR presentation for both meetings around what positive practice is there that's going on between the directorates. Because the risk when when the challenges are so extreme and that the 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 um resource challenges are so high, but within the directorates, there's also some interesting comparisons in this particular case around the children, children and young people's directorate and the work they're doing with our um quality improvement team. So there's a real focus on within some very, very difficult numbers, trying to pull through and share best practice across the directors in terms of waiting list management. The other factor that was across the two meetings was around our finance colleagues and the focus on getting the balance right between making due provision for future financial risks, but not getting to the point where we don't use the resources that we have within the business year, if I can call it that, for the for the best benefit of, of our patients. So this is always um, a challenge. Um, Anna has rightly called that the, the, the balance is probably a bit wrong. We're probably not doing enough around understanding how we absolutely use every pound and penny we've got to deliver for our um, for, for, for the population we serve. So that's been a big focus. And, and that's that's going to continue through into the when the, the 23, 24 planning that Anna talked about in her report at the beginning of the meeting. So Julie, they were the only, other than taking the paper as read, they, I'm conscious there's some questions, but they more relate to FOI. So if you want me to, I can go straight through to FOI or, or pause there. Um, we'll start with the questions. It's suddenly gone dark in here, <laughs> where I am. Um, we'll just go to the questions. The first one was risks and concerns. This is the paper says it'd be helpful if the importance of providing the data requested to the FOI team is in a timely manner was emphasized from the executive level. Has or how will this be done? In fact, we discussed this uh, um, because board and council of governors is very close. This was actually discussed at, um, at board yesterday as well. And I don't know if you want to answer it, if you want Anna to answer it. Who answered it yesterday? I think. Well, I'll, I'll come to Anna. I think yeah, the 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 important there's two the tie up with the two questions, isn't it? About how do you get that process going through? Yeah. So I think it picked up by uh, one of our governor colleagues about um, Carol Smith moving on. Yeah. Um, Carol's done a, a a really really great job and. Uh, I think the concern in the question was what happens next, but I'll, I'll go to Anna first around her perspective on how FOI looks at CPFT versus elsewhere, and then perhaps to Stephen regarding what's happening next in terms of recruitment. 
Yeah, well, I can probably answer both, actually. So um, so Carol has gone. We've got some interim resource there. We've recruited to the um, substantive role and we've recruited um, a, an experienced um, FOI manager. So no gap in service. Um, and, and whilst uh, the, the new person isn't Carol, we're confident that they will be able to deliver um, as great a service and um, supporting our teams to respond to the requests that we get through the FOI Act. And we had a really good discussion at um, BMP committee in terms of you know our compliance is really good you know the, the majority of our um, responses we get in well within the 20 days and um, a good chunk of them within five days good use of our um, website where there are a repeat, repeat requests so we can point to those um, and actually you know the um, the amount of priorities that our clinical teams and operational teams have um, I think it's quite amazing that we have the um, response rate that we do so uh, confident that with the new person coming in place we'll be able to continue that good level of performance. Thank you, Anna. I think it's also worth, but just for scale, Julie, the, the 383 um, FOI requests that came in to, to the, for the first nine months to the end of December, within those, there were 7,380 questions asked. So it does give a sense, you think 383 requests, that doesn't sound like an enormous amount, but you've got, you know, the thick end of 7,500 questions within that. So it just, you know, some vexatious, some very genuine, you know, all the mix within them. So it's an extraordinarily difficult thing to keep on top of and as Anna has said it, it, it's it's really quite impressive the way that, that, that that's happened over a consistent period of time now. Thanks and there was a, a message which I'm sure uh, Caroline will pass on to um uh to Carol in terms of thanks for the work that she's done so thank you for that. Um, the appraisal performance remains low um uh, Stephen, can you give an update on what's happening with appraisals and I think that that came through in Joan's um uh, slides as well in terms of where where staff at the point of the um, uh, of doing the survey felt that appraisal was. Although I have to say, when Ian and I visited a team um, in Peterborough, they did actually say that they all had them uh, and had them. So there's clearly differences across the organisation as well. Um, but we also know appraisal is not just a one one in a once off in a year conversation it's it's a continual conversation and our staff get supervision so can you give the context of where we're currently sitting Stephen and what's currently happening thanks very much Julie so um if you look at the IPR the IPR slows a very slow and gradual improvement around appraisals at 50 54 55 percent um, it's very much um, overseen at what we call our performance and risk exec and 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 that's where once we meet with the directorates we talk through um, what's going on from a whole set of sort of issues and um, you know, with the directorates, et cetera, and also some positive conversations there as well, I hasten to add. Um, what we've just done is we've just actually allowed through what we call our MI reporting, so you can now see down to individual level within your teams who's had an appraisal, who has not had an appraisal. Um, so again, it's very much around sort of just giving the manager the right tools to have some of those conversations. Going forwards, what we've done as an organization we are basically we've got a new policy and process that's just going through we discussed at exec today and it's going to our trust leadership team and that's called scope for growth policy and that actually brings together our appraisals our supervision and also our continuing professional development policy into a single policy that recognizes everything you've just said julie that actually this isn't a one-off this is a continuum you shouldn't get to your appraisal and suddenly be told well actually you're not doing particularly very well it should be discussed through your management supervision through your clinical supervision for your professional supervision you should be having that switched on switched off depending on how you're doing so that when you get to your appraisal then basically you, you have a much better understanding and it makes that the, the appraisal a much more positive experience um, than actually some of the feedback we've got going back to the staff survey for a moment um, even though we're below the average actually 70 odd 79 percent of those people um, said actually they had an appraisal which is slightly different to actually what's been recorded on our current system and actually the appraisal scores all went up which again, I think was quite interesting in the STAR survey. Um, so there's there's going to be a new system switched on um, late April, um, and we've done a lot of consultation around that. And as I say, it's under that scope for growth policy. And as I say, it brings it all together under one umbrella. 
and it will be very much around a bit of a career conversation for those individuals who need it and have it. It will be very much around health and well-being, because one of the questions we've had from governors previously is appraisal light. What's been its impact? What's been its sort of take up? What's been its sort of effect? Well, one of the positive bits of feedback is, is that that health and well-being component people really like. And again, in the staff survey, that was one area where actually we did increase around feedback on the health and well-being and the health and well-being team. Um, so all of that's mixed into the new appraisal process. And then from a, a NED holding the directors to account, um, that actually policy, et cetera, and process will go to PS&Q as well for review. And I think that's really important that Karen and others can actually see that. And we did also talk about appraisal in the cultural context with if you get if you have managers that go, oh, my God, I've got to do appraisals. Um, it, be, it actually then feeds through uh, to a not very um, positive experience. But if it's right, let's do your appraisal and let's see what's been happening over. Well, looking at how we've actually coming to the full stop at the end of the year and have we covered the things we said we cover in supervision and making it into a positive experience. It's it's the whether your glass half full or your glass is half empty in terms of being a manager but it's, it has to has to be coming from the manager and then the then the mem member of staff looks forward to it as opposed exactly. to being, oh exactly God. And, yeah. and Julie, just to say it is that narrative it is that it is that sort of interaction and the other thing is we're introducing Q, QR, QR codes because some of the feedback is actually it's a bit difficult to get it onto systems so yeah. again now actually staff will be able to use QR codes to actually get it onto the system so again we're trying to do as much as possible to make it lean and yeah. helpful and supportive yeah, and that was the feedback Ian and I had as well. They they thought they were all they knew they were all done, but they didn't think they were all on the, loaded on the system. So, yeah. So hopefully that gives a level of assurance and reassurance. But again, that's something that will go back to PS and Q, and we'll continue having the conversations about as we go through. Um, next one is the integrated performance report. So just change your partner, Jeff. And this time it's um has progress with referrals to routine and urgent CAMS eating disorder pathways been maintained since December, the date of the report? Debbie. Um, it's not as simple as yes and no, it does vary. It depends on how many referrals we get at one time. It has bounced around, but we have kept them as low as possible. Um, and um, they are very small single figure numbers um, and we address each one individually. So um, at times, yes, at times, no. Sorry, that's not. That's yeah. No, I mean that's fair because actually, if you think once you've got it down, it's always going to stay there. You're in a. Yeah. That's that's where you make mistakes because these things do go up and down. Yeah. Referring back to what childrens have done in the way of the quality work and the way that they're looking at all their referrals now, it is addressed on a daily, stroke weekly basis. Yeah. Good. And then the next one was what's the outcome of the cost benefit analysis presented at PREs in February to address the transfer of carer information. Um, so we've continued to look at that um, and the carer information that's on Rio is quite old now. So we're sort of revisiting about the, the benefit of actually transferring that um, and, and whether or not we should take a different approach. So um, I haven't got the answer around the cost benefit, but that's what we're doing at the moment. Because that really feeds into the next one, which is also about NEDS explaining their understanding about the actions with Triangle of Care. But is that something you're actively looking at as an executive team? It is. Yeah. But yeah, it's something that I'm looking at with the operational teams. Each of the operational teams are identifying um, champions, I guess, to work within so that they have a nominated lead. Um, and um, they, um, they're also developing a carer video, which will be released um, fairly soon. So um, the work progresses and um, it's, it hasn't had the momentum we want. I do appreciate that. We are continuing with it, but we have had to focus on the waiting list and it is a case of us prioritising um, and each of the, the um, directorates are looking at that now and having individual nominated people to um, drive that forward. And actually the, the, the area that's always, um, maybe if you think about it, with older people and with children, they they have active carers. But the I'm, I'm not saying that adults don't, but adults has always been the area where we floundered. Is there anything specifically being looked at by the adult directorate? It's the video that uh, the adults are starting um, with, um, and um, yeah, they're looking at um, team individual teams because again, it, it really does depend. Some of our patients with long term mental health problems um, perhaps have more. Uh, um, 
work with carers, whereas those that don't, don't you know, those that have a short term or a, a, a short spell of care with us, we don't, we, you know, don't interact so much with carers. And there's also the issue around consent around how much we can work with carers um, from the patient themselves and whether the patient's able to have the capacity to give the consent. There's lots of different issues within there. And I think that was raised before. And what the, the essence was, it's how you have that contract before they become unwell yeah. um which when they're actually unwell they might not be quite as reasonable as they would have been and saying yes it's absolutely fine so i think there's some upstream work that needs to be done with adults that uh, we were doing and we haven't um perhaps been as assiduous during covid at all keith i don't know if you want anything about carers because as you're a from a carer's perspective i could say a great deal about carers <laughs> if you'd like me to julie <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, <clears throat> th 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 thank you for those um, responses, um, Debbie. Um, I, I, I think I, I'd speak not just for the care of governors, but for the Council of Governors that um, it, it is it is an area that um, uh, we, we hope um, can can now um, re re receive the attention that we, we think it deserves um uh and um at the carers program board which i chair we had a presentation recently from uh, older people services as to how they've um uh managed uh, to improve um their performance with regards to engaging uh, with carers and and it, it was it was excellent stuff and and there, there's certainly some knowledge and some understanding there that could be transferred. Um, so I, I hope that it's possible, particularly for the adults directorate to build on that, because that does seem to be where the figures are lowest at the moment. That's really helpful. And I think, you know, this is always some, gonna be something that's a burning issue for governors. You know, when governors um, had an objective and a, a performance measure, it was around carers. Um, Elizabeth Mitchell was passionate about it. Keith's then taking it on. And it really is important because a lot of governors join because they they are themselves carers or actually have seen carers struggling um, with trying to connect with the organisation. So I do think this is an area that we really do have to focus on and get people to really think about. And quite often when we have clinicians, they talk about how important, I mean, when we do consultant interviews, they talk about how important the families are. And we always have a carer representative actually on the panel. And the responses are great and you just think if that's all translated into the practicalities we wouldn't actually have a problem so i think for me this does need to stay on the agenda and we do need to keep the trust feet to the fire because this has been something that's been pushed for probably six or seven years now um, uh, and we do need to make sure that we can make a difference because carers can make a difference to the in some ways to the waiting lists and the things that you're struggling with so it's it is a it is a win-win if we can actually get it right um moving on to so Julie can I just yes. come in quickly yeah, there yeah, so yeah, sorry yeah. Um, it's just to let people know that we are about to go out to advert for a carer's lead um a, which will be a trust-wide um position working in Anna Chuk's team so we um can kind of get some more pace around how we strengthen the voice of carers and all the improvement work that's required Excellent. Thank you very much for that. That's really, really positive contribution. Thank you. Um, finance report. Um, Thanks, Julie. Should I just pick up? I mean, yeah, in the interest yeah, of time, it would just be to say, I think everyone could see it's a, it's a month eight report. So that means going through to the end of November. You may have seen in the report that at the time there was a £332,000 uh, surplus for the year to date budget is to hit uh break even and that that as we close out the year which is effectively tomorrow um and the work that goes on in 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 april to to to, to close out the year end that that remains the target so that's been the focus uh for the finance team in the period since you see the report in front of you um in addition to the 23 24 planning both CPFT and also system integration as Anna referred to in her uh, briefing earlier. Thanks. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, one I, I know is from Ian only because he and I were at the same uh, at, at the same visit and uh, Ian just fit to reassure you I have already put this in in the feedback report to the executive and I don't know if Anna has a response on it yet because 
there was a real issue for the team around interpreting services in Peterborough and the fact that the current uh, supplier was at short notice actually cancelling um, and saying they couldn't make it, which made it really difficult having already set up the meeting with, with the um, service user that they actually wanted to interact with. And um, I think the issue there is about how are we managing the contracts? And there was another issue with SBS, but it's is to get some assurance for, for Ian particularly, but I'm sure others would want to know that there's, there's some assurance behind the actions that we're taking with our suppliers. So, so if I take it backwards, Julie, so SBS, yep. very aware of the issues and we're in a contractual process at the moment. So obviously I can't say much more than that. Um, with regards to interpreter, interpreting services, that wasn't something I was aware of. So really grateful that that was raised and that just shows the benefit, doesn't it, of doing these visits. So we'll absolutely have a look at that because there are other providers out there and, and certainly I've worked with providers who've um, given a really good service, um, which I know was more complex during COVID, but actually we don't have those same um, barriers now. So I think you're right, we need to look at that, look at the contract and see what the options are. And this is one of the things we can do at the system level, actually, isn't it? Because we all need um, an interpreting service. And you will find it on my report, which I think Caroline's got and probably summarising as we speak to the execs to make sure that you've got it. But I did actually send a copy. Um, I have a little cue now. Ian? Yeah, just the interpreting thing was, I mean, I've got an interest because I'm a freelance interpreter for another <laughs> agency called Sintra Language Services, who make sure that all interpreters are properly trained and uh, properly paid, etc. I suspect DA Language Services put in a lower bid for the contract. That's probably why they got it. I don't think we can say that here, Ian. I think, <laughs> I think what we can just talk about is the current performance issue. So thank you. It's okay. <laughs> All yes. Um, yes, I think interpreting is an important aspect, particularly in Cambridge at the moment with the number of um, the um, asylum seekers we have been receiving into the system. Now, in my area, we've had 230 come to our village and they've been most welcomed by the local community. But it's not just language services, it's an issue. It's also cultural ones as well. Um, just because you can translate something doesn't mean sometimes that there aren't cross-cultural misunderstandings which come from either yep. where they live or perhaps their religion. So I think it's important to also note that these should be considered along with translation services. Yeah, no, that's definitely, the, the team are very aware of that. So, so never fear. Debbie. Um, sorry, yeah, notwithstanding some of the quality issues that we may have had with translators um, and the, um, the service itself we're, we're doing a piece of work internally to ensure that all staff do know how to access um, interpreting services so that they can access them in a quick and timely way what we found recently from some of the discussions and has come through the cultural review is staff didn't know how readily available our interpreting services and how easy they can access them so we're doing that alongside which you know um, may help with some of the situations we've we've come across okay i think when, if you're working in the community it's really difficult if you don't have an interpreter alongside mm -hmm. it actually always doubles the time that you spend on on a particular um uh job or or assignment so um it is important that we do support staff in that um next there are a couple of questions i don't know who'd be able to answer this i don't know I think we do but Anna, do we get funded for health needs of refugees so my understanding is that you know we're 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 kind of funded, aren't we, in a block to um, support those people living in our area, and we know people come out of the area in terms of um, out other parts of the UK, but also refugees. There is a national process for reclaiming healthcare costs um, for non-UK residents. I don't know how that applies to refugees, and I don't know, I was looking at, at Debbie, maybe you know that, no. Um, there is a, we can claim cost, but I don't know the process, so yeah. And we haven't got, got here tonight, so for the complex and complicated, I don't think we've got Derek either, have we? But I think he'd have put his hand up and have uh, said something by now, if, if, if there was, so um, no, not, we can't give you that answer, but if it's if if anybody needs to know, we we'll try and find out for you. The other one is um, the pay disputes and the, whatever the percentage rises. How is it going to be funded? Again, we discussed this at board yesterday, uh, and there are 
Oh, you're nodding. Do you want to just say what? It yeah. Is? So, so the assumption is that any pay increases above those which have been um, assumed within our um, our allocations to date um, will be paid, uh, will be provided for nationally. Where that national money will come from is another matter. It'll come out of the rabbit's hat. <laughs> the rabbit will be pulled out of that. And last but no means least, Fullbourne Resource Centre is now operational in some respects. In fact, that's where the pharmacy is, if you wanted to see it. Um, and uh, it's going to be open later in the year, but actually it's fully, is it? It's not no, quite it's open. open. No, it's open. It's open. So I've been there today. And the really good news is that the Edge Cafe um, will be in and up and running from Tuesday, uh, Monday, Monday the 3rd. The visit yeah. board will have a nice cup of coffee. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, brilliant. OK, um, that's all your questions. Just have another couple of one is the charitable funds management uh, committee assurance report. I'm not sure there's anything that we've had no questions on that. I'm not sure that anybody wants to say anything unless Ed, you want to say something on the on the on the charitable funds committee. Well, just very briefly to uh, let governors know, I've just started as chair of this committee and I'm quite excited about it. Uh, as you'll know, Head to Toe has actually done pretty good job of substantially growing income and spending over the last couple of years. And uh, the team is now back to full strength. And uh, we are hoping to see further growth in income and spending and a bit more of a strategic focus, perhaps on some of the bigger targets related to Cambridge Children's uh, and making sure the brand head to toe is as visible um, across the organization and beyond as possible. So I'm quite excited. Brilliant, thank you. And then the um, terms of reference and the cycle of business, it's for your approval, but nobody has said that they had any questions or queries about it. Is there any last minute questions or queries about the uh, terms of reference or cycle of business? No, happy? Right, approved, Caroline. Um, and that's, there. I have been, I've not had any other business apart from I, I brought that in a lot earlier. Um, so thanks everybody. Has anybody else got any final things they want to say? Anthony. Yes, just very quickly. I was wondering if we could just give a verbal commendation to Head to Toe to thank them for their hard work and efforts in charitable fundraising. Yes, we can. And we'll make sure that's passed on. So um, they'll be very pleased to hear that. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, so with that, thank you, everybody, for um, your engagement. Thanks for the long list of questions, which actually um, we got through. I'm really pleased to say. And uh, if anybody feels that their question wasn't fully answered, then please come back and we'll make sure it is answered. If, if I don't know who answered the question on the refugees, but uh, we'll try and seek an answer for that. And uh, perhaps Caroline can put it in the actions and we'll make sure that's answered properly in the actions and not closed off till after the next meeting. So. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, and have a have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.